Hey guys, how you doing? This is Seymour Duncan, and MJ, Sydney, and MJ over here from the custom shop. Anyway, we want to uh, talk to you about a bunch of little things, and uh, this is our first attempt to doing uh, some live TV here for me in a custom shop. And uh, I want to talk about a bunch of um, things, you know, about what the custom shop is and, and why we're doing it and what we do here in the custom shop, which is really pretty cool. And for me, uh, being a guitar player, uh, pretty much all my life, uh, it's a place where I can experiment and I'll write up the recipe and MJ will make it for me, and uh, which is a great team. You know, MJ has been with me for about 30 years now. And uh, so we, we've done some pretty incredible things here in the custom shop over the years. And uh, uh, a little bit about myself, I grew up in South New Jersey. I'm a New Jersey kid. And I was very lucky to, uh, uh, we had three TV channels, and I used to watch the, uh, like, Ed Selvin show, and then uh, there was a, a show called uh, Ted Mack Original Amateur Hour. And then uh, I was watching it one night, and I saw this little kid play San Antonio Rose on a Fender Stratocaster. And I was about 12 years old, I guess, and I, I saw this kid do a backflip, and the applaud meter went pretty crazy for this uh, group, you know. And I told my dad, I said, Dad, I want to play guitar, you know, and I thought it was so cool. So I was the um, only child growing up, so I was so, you know, in love with the guitar, you know, for about what we were doing and everything. And then uh, I decided that uh, I wanted to get a, a guitar for Christmas, you know. For uh, I kept looking in the Sears Silvertone catalog, and I was having a great time uh going through the different pictures of all the different guitars and everything that they had. And then one day, uh, uh, it was about a month before Christmas, and I put the catalog out, and I said, Dad, man, here, this, isn't this a cool looking guitar here? And uh, it was a, uh, a you know, semi-acoustic electric silver tone. And the neat thing about it is it looked like a Les Paul. And so uh, that Christmas, I opened the box, and my parents bought me an accordion instead of a guitar, and I was so disappointed. I was distraught, in fact. You know, so for me, uh, that was my beginning to understanding how much I really love guitar. So my uncle let me borrow his guitar, and it was a uh, an acoustic. My uncle Howard Duncan, and he's the one that got me really uh, showed me my first guitar chords, and uh, then he gave me two records. He gave me a EP of Jimmy Bryant and Speedy West. And then the second one was uh, Chet Atkins, and uh, so I've ha I still have those records. They're the only thing I have from my childhood are those two records, you know, that my uncle Howard gave me. So the following Christmas, I finally got my Sears Silvertone guitar, and that started the whole thing about it. And I was very fortunate to have a cousin that would take me to see some bands. She would drive me around. And um, I would go see Roy Buchanan, and Roy Buchanan was a uh, probably one of my uh, biggest influences in the first guitar I actually saw. You know, I was listening to Dwayne Eddy, and I saw him on the uh, American Bandstand with Dick Clark. But I actually met Roy Buchanan, who was just a fantastic guitar player, uh, a local hero in South New Jersey at the time. He was playing at a club called Dick Lee's. So for me, uh, seeing him play, it was such a, a great inspiration, and um, he, in fact, helped me get my first Telecaster, and it was a 56 Telecaster, and so I started playing a lot of club gate uh, dates, and we were playing a place called Tony Martz in uh, Ocean City, New Jersey, and uh, while there, uh, the club had three different bands that would play in it at one time. This club called Tony Martz, and it's where uh, a lot of uh, great, you know, really great bands. We were just a young band. We were like 15, 16 years old playing at this club. And on the other stage was a band called Levon and the Hawks, which was Robbie Robertson, which later became the band. Bob Dylan saw him and said, that's the band. So that became the band for Bob Dylan. But it was originally Levon and the Hawks with Levon Helm. Robbie Robertson, Garth Hudson, uh, uh, just a really great band. But Robbie had a, an old telly, and mine, we would compare it. And uh, we would open the guitar up to look at the circuit inside, and his was different than what mine was. I think his was like a 54 
Telecaster and mine was a 56 so there was a little bit uh, wiring difference so um, uh, we were always trying to figure out why and and so we didn't really know at the time what, what it was so my first attempt to um, wind a pickup when I was about 16 uh, somebody had borrowed my guitar and they got the high E string hooked under the uh, bridge tele pickup so uh, I broke it I had I went to, I was in high school and I went to school and, and uh, took the pickup apart to see what was happening with it and I saw all the magnet wire from the quill all broken in pieces. So that was my actually the start of me uh, trying to figure out how the guitar worked and everything. And my first coil machine was a record player uh, that went uh, 33 and a third, 78 and 45 RPMs. And I made a block of wood and I mounted the Tele pickup on it and that's how I made my first coil machine and I had to fix the pickup and I actually put more wire on it than apparently originally had because I was winding it to the the wax mark that was on the bobbin itself and I actually wound it to where the string was and not where the actual coil was so I put maybe another uh, 1500 more turns on it and then uh, so my became my telly had this very unique sound it wasn't as bright or twangy as an original telly and I figured by putting a little bit more turns on it, it had a higher DC than what it originally had. And uh, uh, that was the start of me getting the idea of what wire would do with a guitar pickup. So from then, you know, I, I was hanging out with Ruby Cannon, and I met Danny Gatton, and then um, I, I was very fortunate, you know, to see a lot of these guys. And then my friend had a record uh, collection. His dad was a jukebox. Uh, supplier and he would put 45s in the jukeboxes so we went to his basement and I saw this one instrument it said instrumental and I said oh what's this and I heard this guitar thing and it was called Albert's Alley and Defrost was on the other side of it and uh, it was Albert Collins and that really blew me away for the sound that he was getting out of his Telecaster so from then on I was just you know trying to find records all over the place that I could you know so um, I started uh, working on other people's guitars and working with a lot of people and then I ended up uh, traveling uh, the band I had we were touring with the Shirelles back in 1966 and we ended up in Lima Ohio and while I was there uh, this guy came up to me in a club and he says you know I have one of those there guitars like you have you know and I said you're kidding he says but it doesn't have that shiny silver thing in the in the neck position and I said, is it a Fender Esquire? He said, yeah, it must be old because it has an old black pickguard on it and everything. I said, you're kidding. And uh, I had a Fender foot pedal that was a, uh, uh, it was like a, a oh, I don't know what you want to call it. It was a, a just a volume pedal that, and it had a tone control in it. So you take, take do it sideways and up and down. It was for pedal steel guitar players. And I could do volume swells with it. And the guy just he just fell in love with his pedal, and, he, and I, he says, "Well, do you want to trade?" He says, "My guitar doesn't work." I said, "It, it doesn't work." He said, "No, no." And uh, I said, "Well, I'll trade you, you know, because at the time I was working on guitars." And then when I got it, I saw it had the old poodle case. It was a '53 Esquire Fender Esquire, and the only reason it didn't work was the jack had fallen out of it, and when when he put it back in and tightened it. He had the knurled nut that was inside the jack shorting out to the uh, control of the guitar. So I just said, oh man. So I got it fixed and working and uh, that was that was the guitar. That was my first uh, Esquire that I ever ever saw or ever found, you know. So, and it sounded so much like Roy Buchanan. So I was very proud to tell Roy about it and everything. So, uh, but growing up, um, I, when I would travel from city to city touring, I, I had a little record, a portable record player. I would take my Venture Records and my Chet Atkins and my Jimmy Bryant and uh, then the Yardbirds came out and that was it for me. And then I saw the Rave Up cover and I saw Jeff Beck and he had an Esquire also. So I was like, oh my gosh, there it is. There's that guitar and there's that sound, you know. So anyway, I'm going to put it to MJ a little bit. She's going to tell you what we do here in the custom shop a little bit. MJ? Hi. Well, here in the custom shop, we can build almost anything that you can dream of. 
I mean, one of the other things that we learned or see more working with so many people in, in the industry, um, to save the specs. For him, um, as rewinding his very first own pickup, he learned how to save all the specs and how he either, I mean, deduct some turns or add some turns or, I mean, the name of the musician that for him was important at the moment, you know, archive all that history and, I mean, in working side by side with him, we have learned that, you know, that usually help us not only to recreate new products, but as well as to go ahead and give the same tone with that particular artist who inspired you, I mean, and recreate the same pickup that they did. One of the things that we have in here is, uh, for example, pickups that we did, Seymour did back in the days for um, Eddie Van Halen. Um, he did for Albert Lee, for CC Top, for Steve Miller, Jeff Beck, um, Roy Buchanan, Danny Gatton, uh, Joseph Walsh, Albert Lee, and you name it, you name it. I mean, every single pickup that it gets done in the costume shop gets archived. And we're talking a pickup that either was done by Seymour back in 1976 when the first company started up to right now. This is the way that if we need to recreate an old pickup like the 78 model that we did, Seymour we won for Eddie Van Halen back in 1978, it can still be done with the same specs, the same bobbins, the same wire, the same exact thing. Um, when we come about rewinding, because we also rewind a lot of pickups, and we also have a history of saving all the space that we do. It helps us a lot when we're going to recreate a pickup, an old pickup. And it, I mean, a good example is the, the staple pickup or the Dynasonic. I mean, and not only to, I mean, recreate the pickup, but also the DCs, the minor, the screws, anything that it gets done into this, because then we can offer to you any tweaks that you want to go ahead and do to your pickups. Uh, you say, you know what, I love the fat, the staple, but how can it fit on my list pole? How can it fit, you know? I mean, we are very creative here in the custom shop. In a custom shop, we can do almost anything that you can dream of. As you can see, we do the fat staple, and then I get a guitar builder who tells me, MJ, I love the fat staple. I love the sound, I love the look, but I want to put it on my basses. How can I do that? You know, I mean, for us, saying that creation for us goes farther away than that, we can go ahead and give you a staple for a bass pickup. Or a know? mandolin. Or, or a mandolin, you know. I mean, and I mean, and same thing, I mean, it happened like, you know, one time when, I mean, this could be ideas from, you know, just an end user, Joe Blow from the corner, um, as Billy Gibbons. Billy, Billy Gibbons called and says, MJ, I want three Charlie Christians. And if you're familiar with the Charlie Christian, the Charlie Christian, I mean, it's a pickup that has this big bracket. And it gets mount, you know, like this. And the thing is, in the custom shop, we make all these parts, too. We don't buy the parts. We actually design them. The engineering department will uh, draw them up. We'll do uh, very specific drawings. And we'll have, we have an engineering department. We make all the stuff we hand fabricate it here at our shop in Santa Barbara. So we can do anything, pretty much so. But you can see all the components that go into making a Charlie Christian, which is really pretty cool, you know? Yeah. And she, I mean, Billy Gibbons will say, you know, I want three. I said, Billy, you having three guitars done? He says, no, MJ, one guitar. How are you going to put three of these pickups on, this, on one guitar? Have you seen the size of the pickup? I said, oh, I don't know. I says it's going to have three of those. I said, it does for you and Seymour to figure out. I ran to Seymour and said, Seymour, we have a problem. Billy Kevins wants three of these in one guitar. Seymour starts laughing and goes, MJ, not a problem. He came out in through the back, you know. We do a little slight modification, you know. He says, he can do back mounting on these pickups or picker mount because we do a little bracket and then it could be picker mount, you know. So we send it to Billy, he gets it, he loves it, but then he says, in some of my places it's too noisy, MJ, what can we do about it? And she's laughing about it, I said, hey, you want us to cut it in half and, you know, and make it unbucking? He says, yeah, I think that would be the solution. Obviously, I was joking, cut it in half and, you know, and make it unbucking. But then Mr. D comes into the door and says, yeah, MJ, that's right, cut it in half and make it unbucking. And this is exactly what we did. 
So obviously, we do the work. You give us your imagination. You know, I mean, we can create a stuff. Sometimes we can be creative. The tone might not be there for you. You said, you know what? I really like that pickup. I like the way it looks. I like the way, I mean, uh, but I don't like the way it sounds. But then that's where we come in again. Okay? Because like you can see, this pickup could be for many people. But we need to we need to go ahead and we need to go ahead and do, I mean, make them vintage, make them medium, or make them hot. So I mean one one thing that we work on first is the look. You know, the tone we can go on many ways, you know. I mean we can be very creative. Maybe the picket that we're doing for Joe Blow in the corner is not gonna work for, for uh, Billy Gibbons or the pickup that we're doing for Steve Miller is not gonna work for John Fogarty. But I mean, if it's the same guitar, different woods, different weight, I mean, anything, we take everything into consideration in here. We take your size of the strings, your tone and volume control knobs, the, the weight of the guitar, the woods of the guitar, the finish of your guitars, and then we try to give you the best tone that you can, you know, be dreaming of. Um, one of the other things is we do very cosmetic engravings, you know, and these are special things, you know, it's kind of, I mean, um, a lot of people has been asking about the wide range humbuckers, you know. A, a wide range humbucker is a great pickup, you know, and like I said, you know, the tone, the looks is one thing, the tone is another one. We can go ahead with a very old original tone or we can go ahead and, and do a new one. And this pickup too is also uh, originally designed by Seth Lover, who designed your uh, traditional uh, beginning with the PAF humbucker, and some of the earlier uh, Firebirds and uh, the mini humbuckers. They were designed by Seth Lover, so we were uh, very proud to have him involved with Seymour Duncan as just a friend for one thing, but uh, just all his ideas and you know he's, he was a clever man he was very ingenious for what he could do and everything but he designed that uh, for Fender and uh, so we've had a lot of requests for it too so we we actually do some uh, custom modifications on them too for a little bit different sounds using uh, different magnets and poles and but uh, we've become very uh, creative here in the custom shop working with many different people and you know we, we've worked I've worked with a lot of you know, very high profile artists, but you guys are just important to us uh, as the high profile guys. You know, I want you to feel free to, if you have an idea, no idea is too silly or too out out there. You know, I mean, we've had some pretty bizarre ones and everything, and uh, but we we'll do it. I mean, we we do it here. I'm here just about every day. We're doing custom work, but the fun thing is, uh, you know, create your own sound. You know. Uh, you know, you, when you go into a club, you want somebody to say, hey, there's there's Billy Bob, you know, and, and you can hear the tone that he gets out of it, you know. And we have artists come in like, uh, I'm so proud to be working with Joe Bonamassa right now. And uh, he, he is a very, uh, you know, he's so in tune to what he's looking for. He knows what he's looking for sound-wise. The same way as... Uh, the work I've done for Eric Johnson for many years. I've been working, I, I have my original letters from Eric Johnson from back in the 80s. And uh, then, uh, God, working, I mean, with so many great artists over the years. You know, it's, it's been really fun, but you guys are so important too. And, and you guys are the future guitar players out there, you know. And, and a lot of you guys may not like to be a high profile player, but you like staying in your hometown or just even recording and that that's so cool and that's what I enjoy working with you guys for too because uh, you guys are coming out with some really cool tones when you're recording and, and I like doing that you know we're here I, I love MJ and I we're always playing with Matt we have every magnet in the world every every type from Anico two three four five six seven eight and all the different ceramics uh, that we use and I'm not a real uh, fan of a ceramic magnet because they're a little bit too harsh for the sound, but they they have their their situation. You know, they work fine. And but uh, we're gonna. Uh, and one funny thing, I mean, we love our magnets. Yeah, we, we do, man. We we love them so much that we nickname them. You know, we have brownie, we have greeny, we have ready, we have. You know, we yeah, nickname. Bluey. You know, yeah, we we nickname our magnets. You know, our 
our magnets are, you know, are usually, I mean, close to us because whenever we design a pickup, we, we not only think, like Seymour says, define your tone, be yourself. Because you don't have to be Eddie by Haley, you don't have to be Peter Frampton to be in this book. I mean, anybody is in this book. Because we don't know when you're going to be the next Eddie Van Halen, when you could be the next Peter Frampton, when you can be the next Steve Miller. So for us, I mean, you are as important as one of our high-profile artists. And any expect that is done, any single pickup is done in here. I mean, even if it was done with brownie, with a greenie, with bluey, with, you know, black. That's, that's with, our magnet you know, nicknames. That and and that, those are yeah. usually our minus nicknames, you know. I mean, we... We usually, I mean, even our parts, you know, Seymour and I have a thing that we describe the stuff that people in here that come to us say, what are they talking about? But what we do, we don't do it like on a production type of line. We don't do it like, you know, like robots do, you know. I mean, when we do something for you, we put our heart and soul into whatever we're doing, you know. Yeah. We think about it. We take into consideration the woods of your guitar, like we said, we take into consideration the strings that Tony on the volume control now, but also we put our heart and soul into it, you know. I mean, we don't care if it's six o'clock in the morning or if it's 10 o'clock at night, you know, if we, you know, I mean, we're still thinking and giving the best of us to go ahead and finish whatever we need to be working on. Uh, one of the things that we understand, I mean, a pickup. A pickup is who made a person who it is right now. I mean, obviously they, they got the guitar and, 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 and they, you know, and they have the tone, their fingers and everything. But without the pickup, I mean, probably they wouldn't be who, whoever they are right now. Yeah, and the, that's, the, that's what we're here for. The, the pickup is, uh, to me, the heart of the instrument. And it's the tone, it, it really uh, defines the tone of the piece of wood that is in the actual guitar. You know, you can have a, uh, a very inexpensive guitar or you can have a $250,000 Les Paul but like working with Joe Bonamassa you know he can't afford to take these really expensive guitars a lot of times or anybody can on the road because they're so valuable so you want to make a guitar that will have the sound of your $250,000 guitar I mean I don't even have a guitar like that you know I mean it's 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 a very uh, high collectible thing you know and and I like my Fender Tellies and Jazz Masters. I mean, they're they're my favorite guitars that I collect. And I like SGs. I like Gibson SGs. So uh, you'll see me playing my Telly Gib, which is my uh, Seymour Duncan 35 guitar. I retired my old one, but that had my original uh, JB in it and my Jazz Model Neck. So those pickups to me are m my tone. You know, my type of sound that I play. You know. And somebody else can play that guitar and they'll say, oh, no, it's too dark for me or it's too bright or something. So that's why we make so many different models of pickups because your ears hear something different than somebody else hears it. So MJ and I, we have this you know, routine. We ask about what strings you use and the type of guitar, the body, the weight. We, we ask guys to weigh the guitar because I have a formula that I can, I've done for uh, uh, Iron Maiden, like... Uh, Steve in the band, bass player, he has like 10 basses and he wanted them all to sound the same, but they all had different weights to them. So I had a formula that I worked out where I would make them all sound the same. And the same with Billy Gibbons, you know, he didn't want to have to change guitars all the time. And we made several different models for him. But working with the artists, you know, some of them uh, just have some pretty wild ideas about what they want, you know. And But you guys are the same way and I love it, you know. I mean, we get some pretty cool uh request from time to time you, you know. know i want to i want to give you guys a little story about seymour i had an end user who called me and knowing that seymour was used to be very close to roy buchanan says you know mj could you make me a roy buchanan set and i said of course i said i know i'm the roy buchanan and i know i'm not going to play like him but i'm going to close my eyes and i'm going to dream that i'm roy buchanan and i'm going to play with my heart and soul you know with this instrument so we sent him the first set of pickups and um, very sad, very disappointed, he says, MJ, I know I told you I wasn't Roy Buchanan, but, you know, this guitar doesn't even sound near like it, you know. And I mean, and you know, there might be something wrong with the pickups. And I go, well, go ahead and send them back to me. And I'll go ahead and redo, but, you know, I gave you the Roy Buchanan tone, you know. I send the second set, and the same thing, you know, and I'm going, Seymour, 
something is going on in here. I'm doing the speakers with the specs that I have on these sheets in here, you know, and they're not working for this gentleman. Well, tell him to send the whole guitar in. We need, I need to check that out. So um, I had the guitar here in the floor, arrive, I'm opening the guitar, and Seymour is just walking into the door, you know, and from far away, Seymour goes, what's that, MJ? I said, oh, remember the Roy Buchanan tone guitar? I said, I can see her from right here. Tell him to change his bridge plate. It's not, a, it's not metal, it's a stainless steel. I said, how do you know? MJ, I know. But yeah. guess what? He came closer to the guitar, he looked at the plate, we put a minor to it, and he was right. We called the guy, we ordered a play from Fender, they sent us a play, we put it on the guitar, the guy sent us a picture, said, MJ, I'm not lying to you, look, my fingers are bleeding, I apologize for everything that I put you guys through, but this guitar sounds amazing, amazing, and he was super pleased, but this is the kind of service yeah. or the kind of stuff, Seymour knows his thing, you know. Seymour has been known also as a, you know, a tele player. So, I mean, it was amazed to me that from far away he could tell me that's not the correct plate, you know, and make someone, you know, just yeah, blow you off from yeah. the corner. Very, very, very happy, you know. So this is what we're here for. This is what we, I mean, live for. We live for to give you the tone that you need. We're here to give you, to find yourself, to define your tone. And, um... And right now, if you have any questions for, for Seymour or myself, he's going to be going and answering some questions. Yeah, the great thing too with, uh, I think with the internet and what you're seeing here and everything is uh, a lot of guys now are starting to send me, they'll send me photos of their guitar, they'll send me uh, MP3s, they'll record it off their iPhone and send send me the file, you know, and I can hear what their guitar sounds like, which is really pretty cool, you know. and. Uh, and then you can see what they're talking about a lot of times. But a lot of times a guy will have a problem and they're trying to explain it to you mm -hmm. and there could be something completely wrong. And uh, I had one friend who was uh, had an old telly and he says, oh, my guitar it just doesn't sound right. And he says, when I turn the volume controls, they're real scratchy. And I says, oh, you probably have to clean or fix your uh, potentiometers. And then I said, well, he said, what should I do? I said, well, get uh, 250Ks and put them in there and that should really help all the dirt and the noise when you're doing sessions and everything it'll keep it clean for you so he comes back he says Seymour he says man this it still doesn't sound right man it's just too bassy you know too way too boomy I can't get enough high ends out of my Telecaster and I said well here try this pickup and so I wound it with a real low resistance with a thicker wire and it would make cats howl in the neighborhood when you would play a note on it you know it was so bright and he says, oh, it's still not bright enough. And I said, oh, Carlos. I said, man, there's something wrong here. And again, he, when he brought the guitar to me, I checked it. He put in two 50K pots each for volume and tone instead of a 250, 250K. So I didn't explain it well enough to him. But once we put the two 50Ks back into audio taper pots for the uh, volume control, it worked great. I mean, it sounded really pretty, pretty cool for him. But uh, we're going to get Scott here, who's managing the floor and uh, or floor director here. He's going to get some questions to me and uh, that you guys have been sending in, so I appreciate it. And who's uh, one of the first questions from? First question is from Donnie on Facebook. He um, says he has a Seth Lover installed on a Court Yorktown hollow body, and it's sweet, very bright and spanky, but also has a nice percussive feel. And what he really wants to know is how can he expect it to age tonally? He says right now it's paired with the P94 in a neck position and he gets a great vintage hollow sound. Um, he doesn't want it to change too much, but he's wondering what you think it'll change tonally over time. Well, I think all pickups, uh, they lose a small percentage of their magnetic field, you know, depending on the environment. A lot of times a guy will uh, be playing in a club and he'll put his guitar on top of a, a you know, a Marshall stack with, uh, you know, four 12-inch speakers with selections or whatever. And uh, that proximity of the other ma magnetic fields can interfere with the magnetic field of your actual pickups. It can demagnetize them. And uh, it happened to Andy Summers when he was on the, uh, the train system in London. 
he was sitting near where one of the, the generators were in the actual train and his pickups got completely demagnetized. So um, be careful with that, but in time, a pickup like that, it can, it, it, it won't get brighter, I'll put it that way. It'll get smoother, it'll, it almost like settles itself, the magnetic field to the guitar strings. It, the, uh, one, the strings have, I think, a lot to play with how a, a pickup works and it'll it'll pull the magnet you know uh, the larger the string will move more magnetic field than a smaller string so I've, I've always believed too when you remove your strings I think a little bit of that magnetic field can actually be taken away from the actual pickups but it's just sort of a myth it's one of my little theories but uh, uh, the, the pickup will just age over time and it depends too on the wood, the wood can change a little bit through time and the aging of it. Uh, the wood can actually dry out or it can absorb more moisture so the wood itself can can do a little bit. I think when you put a new pair of strings on it they sound much brighter than when the strings are being played for a while because you get your oils from your hands into it and the, the string tonality can break down a little bit but uh, you shouldn't have much of a problem you know over time losing too much of the tone but it's a nice combination. All right, um, Farkas on the forum is wondering, when you're working on a new pickup or design, how do you approach the process? For example, do you start with an established wind and make modifications, or do you start with a magnet type and alter the wind? Uh, I can do it a couple different ways, you know. Uh, with me, I have, I've, I've built systems where I can actually calibrate my magnets so I can go any way how any calibration with a magnet that I want. I can change the angle of a magnetic field, I can change the orientation, I can change the uh, the strength of it, you know. Mm -hmm. But we, we first work with a design, uh, you know, string spacing is probably the most important with that you want to start with. And then you need to find out how much space you have from the string to the body or from uh, the cavity of a uh, inside the guitar or the pick guard that you're going to use. And when we build something, we, uh, we've we wound so many coils, after a while you just sort of know, like putting, using a certain gauge wire, how many turns you put on it, what it's going to do, you know. Normally the, 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 uh, the turns are going to really uh, do a couple things. It's going to do the resonant frequency, it's going to do the, uh, determine the output of a pickup. The less turns, normally you have less output. Uh, more turns you put, you get more generated output, uh, and it depends if the output's too much, you can decrease the magnetic field, so you knock it down a little bit, so it's a little bit softer or smoother. If you have a Strat that has a, a stock winding on it, and it, it sounds too bright or too too brittle, I can work with a magnetic field to bring that down, or you could do a, a little RC net where you can put a capacitor to ground like a 0 .001 or 0 .0022 uh, microfarad to ground from the hot output and that will soften the actual uh, the frequency of the pickup. It will make it not as bright. So but when we design something here we we have several different approaches. We'll start with a, a shape of the instrument that has to go into. You try to keep it pretty traditional. You don't get it too crazy. Um, and then you go with the yeah, the, the weight of the wood. I mean, it's important. And that's it's, you're, it's. We have like 25 different variables uh, that we have to work with to design a pickup. You know, from the weight of the wood, the strings you're going to use, the position of the pickup, how high or how far away from the bridge or from the neck that you want to put it. What type of tone they're trying to? Yeah, and what type type of tone you're trying to get out of it? You know, if you're trying to get a passive sound or an active sound. Uh, are, you, are we going to use a preamp or are we going to use a battery system? Does a guitar allow for that? Uh, I prefer passive pickups because I would hate to be on the road somewhere and all of a sudden the battery dies in your guitar and then you can't find a battery. And that's happened even with some, if like somebody uses a pedal, the bat battery dies in it. We can't find a battery anywhere, you know. And uh, so, you know, just. There's a lot of variables that we work with, and we, we make notes and do drawings of everything that we do here. Very good. Good question, though.
Convoys to Nothingness, who is on with us right now, asks, when you are working with an artist or even a regular custom shop customers, and they say things like, I want to hear it scream more, or it's too harsh, or too muddy, or too thick sounding, how do you go about translating these esoteric descriptions into actual pickup specs? Well, they all have their own, uh, you know, each terminology has, has some way of me, like if it's too thick sounding, I'll reduce maybe the magnetic field or the number of turns on it. If it's too bright, uh, again, I can do a, a circuit where I can knock down the brightness of the actual pickup itself. Um, I can calibrate the magnet if it's too bright or wind it where I use a different type of wire and add more turns to it, but not not too crazy, you know, I mean, it's there's all little variables and a lot of times it can have to do with the potentiometer in your guitar, like if you put a 500K in, it's going to, your guitar is going to sound brighter uh, then if you put a 250k uh, audio tape or potentiometer in it. So different values and even though uh, a lot of old guys would uh, that had old guitars would put change the potentiometers and buy new ones and your guitar would sound completely different than when it had the old potentiometer in it. And it's because the tolerances of the older potentiometers would have been like plus or minus 20 percent. So if you if the pickup had a potentiometer and it was 280k uh, in reality, even though it said 250k on the pot itself, uh, that's going to make it sound darker than if you had one that was a 220k potentiometer. So the lower the number is going to sound softer, and the higher the potentiometer value is going to be a lot uh, brighter. Not a lot brighter, but uh, more bright. But, but also taking into consideration to do that, I mean, uh, our extents of minor wires, it's incredible and it's huge, it's big. When we talk about wires, we have different kinds of minor wire on different sizes, but also... It half could be, sizes. Yeah. But, it, but also it could be, like Seymour says, half sizes, because we can have, for example, the 42 plane enamel in, in different variations. I mean, I mean, like heavy, like, you know, mint enamel. I mean, we, we our extents in wires, because we're the custom shop, I mean, it's big, so we can yeah. go from a very, very old vintage, I mean, the stash that Seymour had from Seth Lover to the newest wires that we have in the market to some of the old, heavier installations, and that help us also to define those types of stuff. And, and the thing people have to realize is that the chemical that is used for the insulation on the magnet wire is different today than it was 30, 40, years, 50 years ago. Uh, the old plain enamels, it was called oleoresinous, and it was a certain type of uh, uh, material made by Phelps Dodge, which over the years they had to change their, uh, they had to take the lead out of it because of um, uh, all the OSHA and all the problems you would have with lead, you know, with the employees making it and everything and breathing the fumes. So a lot of uh, materials today are like a, a polyurethane and they're a black or a, you know they have all different colors and stuff but a lot of materials are really different today than they were made back uh, like 40 50 years ago so and humbuckers at Gibson factory where I've been many times uh, were never hand wound Gibson uh, humbucking pickups shouldn't be hand wound because you want to keep each coil uh, basically the same uh, a lot of times when People think their coils are, uh, you know, out of balance and everything. It, it's because the machines back when Gibson was winding them, they were uh, they didn't have automatic shutoffs. They had counters on them, but the lady was working maybe two machines at a time that had three heads on it and each time. So she'd be working one machine and didn't couldn't turn it off in time, and it may have had more turns on it. So she they would physically sit there and pull the turns off so they could get the coil uh, small enough where they could get the tape around it, the insulation tape. And the tape used to be a number four flat back tape which 3M used to make but no longer makes. So... Uh, Talking about that tape. The tape, yeah. Okay, I yeah. mean for us, for Seymour, Seymour Duncan has, I mean, the stuff that he really sticks to the rules in some of those. When it comes about vintage tape, and 3M says, we're not going to make this tape no more. 
And that was the original tape that it was used in most of the PAFs. Yeah. So Seymour went the P90s. And, yeah, and Seymour went and recollect all the tape in the whole factory in here says, we're not using this anymore. This is for me. I mean, he tends to know that, I mean, Seymour Duncan is not going to be here only two or three more years, you know. I mean, he is six in long term. And he loves tradition. And he says, you know, MJ, we need to save this tape because the old PAFs, the old, I'm going to need these tapes. So whenever we get repairs, you know, with the old tape, we use, still use the old original tape that it was used back in the days. Um, when it comes to, I mean, to use the same um, old wires, I mean, if you guys see some of the old requests, if it the tape doesn't have the correct adhesive, it starts eating the minor wire. Yeah, and, the, we, and we Jesus. see it, you know, Eat we see it, you know, we see it all the time, you know. So yeah. so that's why we believe, especially on an old PAF, had to protect those pickups. We know, we know how valuable they are for you, and we know that, you know, the love and heart that we said that we put into that product, we know is the love and heart that you had when you played that instrument. And that's where we try to keep it 100% original for you. Good. Next question. Two questions here, actually. Um, Austin on Facebook wants to know what the hardest pickup you've had to make in the custom shop. And Zaggy from the forum wants to know what is the craziest pickup you've made in the custom shop. Okay, probably the craziest pickup was when I was um, requested to make a pickup for the world's largest guitar for a Discovery Channel. And we did a Discovery, it was called a TV show called Big, and we had to make a uh, humbucker that was ten times the size of a uh, normal pickup. And so I had to think about it and I had to fabricate it from the total beginning. And that was this is a template of half of the pickup. That was a template from one of the bobbins. And here's your normal bobbin, you can see here. And here's one of them. And, and if I, you guys guess, this pickup is less than half a pound. You know? If anybody guess right now, the closest, you know, the sense of thing, how much this pickup weight will win one pickup. One strut wound by, hand wound by Seymour. Yeah, one strut. Figure that one yeah. out. I mean, it was, it was the two, closest, the closest to this size, okay? And um, this is one of one of the craziest ones. Yeah, that was, that was pretty. And what was the other question? The first one. It was the, the hardest and the craziest. Uh, some of the hardest ones to repair are the ones that are epoxied. For one, uh, and this is to build. And to build. Um, I would say it was his first it, one. He started making the Charlie Christians. Well, yeah, that wasn't too bad. Probably the, uh, the one was the staple pickup, which is... Uh, no, I really, no, when you start doing the Charlie Christian with all the... Yeah, before, well, before the, it was laser. the Charlie Christian, um, I, I cut out each piece and had... It was like making model... I grew up making model airplanes, so for me it was so easy. I would cut each piece out and then um, finding the, the cool tools. I, I make all my own tools here for... Uh, fabricating so I would slice each piece of plastic and then glue everything and I had uh, boards I would use a piece of uh, cardboard and then I would put stick pins in it you know and I would glue all these little pieces together and and put it together then you would trim each side and and then glue it all together fabricate it and then uh, I like the buffing part to me you know how I, I like buffing and polishing so to me it's, it's very important you know so uh, probably this is probably the one more, but another one is the uh, the old Gibson, like uh, the old I call it the staple pickup that they were making for the uh, Les Paul Customs, mm -hmm. and they used for some of the I think L5s and everything. But uh, to get all the, to for one have this magnet made, and then uh, cut all these little pieces out that have to be glued to the bottom of the magnet. And to put all this together, it's it's a real pretty intricate pickup and everything. And ours are pretty much made traditional, how the old ones were made and stuff. So uh, it took a lot of work to get the parts together, but once we started making it, uh -huh. it was really really pretty cool. What know? about the 18 pole pickup that you make for one of the movies? Um... Oh yeah, I did uh, 
Star Trek the movie and a thin red line. Uh, I, I was requested again to make. Was big. It was a 18. Uh, it was called the Cosmic Beam pickup, and we had to put five of them on the instrument. And uh, Francis Lupa would take this aluminum bow, and the guitar instrument had. Uh, it was an I beam, it had 18 strings on it, and he would slide the uh, bow back and forth on this instrument, and it was uh, like a quadraphonic sound. So when the the tone the bar would go to the right, the frequency on the right pickup would go higher, but the pickup that was on the left, the pickup would sound very deep and go very low. And if you listen to Star Trek, uh, the movie, when you would hear, see the enemy coming or something, you'd hear a real low rumble, and that was made from this instrument. And, you know? I, and I believe that yeah. pickup probably is still in use because a few years ago, they sent it to be repaired. And that was one because one of the wires had broken and I remember having only about a half an inch of the beginning wire and was able to go ahead and save it and resend it back to them. So, yeah. I mean, that became my still being used and you might still hear it in quite a few movies. Yeah, it's pretty. But we've had some really uh, pretty oddball rewinds. In fact, what I'll do, uh, I'll get with Scott and I'll, I'll, I'll start posting some of these oddball rewinds that we get and some very, very uh, old handmade pickups, probably from the 30s and 40s when pickups were first coming about. Uh, the components that they used and everything were pretty out there and we had to try to replicate it. And I have a, a few here that we're doing right now too. So uh, it's, it's fun, I enjoy doing it. I mean, that's, that's the job. And there's a lot of, uh, of you guys that are hobbyists and, and um, pickup makers out there and you know, there's a difference between manufacturing and I say being a hobbyist. And this is a real funny spot with me because, you know, we we fabricate, we make the parts. Uh, Fender makes the parts, Gibson makes the parts, and they're pretty much big time manufacturers. EMG makes the parts, and we all uh, put things together. We we have our own tooling. We have we have hundreds and hundreds of uh, tooling for different styles of flat work and. And every pickup that we make, you know, thermoform or uh, all all the part, all the flat work we have, we have so many different models. We make probably 300 different models of pickups, and so we have our you know our own flat work that we we manufacture, we pay for, and a lot of the newer guys are just buying the stuff. So you'll see one manufacturer and you see another manufacturer, and they're all using the same components they buy from outside sources and. Uh, so they all have uh, pretty much they're buying the same wire from the same people, the same magnets from the same people. So everybody's just putting their own little homegrown, you know, boutique name on it or whatever, you know. But the Seymour Custom Shop here is a uh, we've been boutique from way back from uh, all the models that we've designed. We do a lot of stuff OEM for a lot of the major manufacturers, which I'm very proud of, and. Uh, and for me, you know, it's been an honor working with uh, the Fender Guitar Company and Gibson and all the other. We've done stuff with Paul Reed Smith. And so for me, it's these guys uh, are important and they're, they're so important in, in the music industry. And I'm so proud of being a part of that, you know. And uh, a lot of times we'll have a, a longtime manufacturer come to us and saying, hey, God, we don't have the specs anymore for how we used to make this pickup. Do you have any record of it? And, and we'll go through our files, and there we got it. You know, we I keep every pickup I've ever I ever made or worked on. Uh, I've taken specs off of, and and uh, I've spent a lot of time doing research. And someday, you know, this will be in a library of Congress. I guarantee it. <laughs> Another All question. All right. So Dean from Sweden on our forum asks, how much human input actually goes into the making of a pickup? Oh boy. If, if uh, you have a chance Human. to see, see our production floor and and what MJ, I mean, I would say a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, there's everything is put together by hand here. You know, I mean, uh, we wind by hand. We we put stuff on machines, but it's all hand done, and all the hookup is all done. I mean, pretty much all pickups are. Pretty I mean, much all, all the pigtail gets all done. The all the loading of the studs, the putting of the screws, the putting of the. I mean, the hooking up with the wires, yeah. the waxing, the taping everything every single detail you know 
And as you can see, when working in the line, and it's very repetitive line, one of these days we're going to take you for a little tour so you guys can see how the stuff gets done on the production floor and how at 1 o'clock and 8 o'clock in the morning because they're doing repetitive work, doing the pigtailing or doing the taping or doing whatever they're doing, we stop and do exercises with music. I mean, we're a music industry and we love to play your music and, you know, and we play different types of music in here and we do a little bit of exercise, you know, to the rhythm of music. But everything, every single little step is, is done by human hands, you know. And the thing too is what's really neat is we'll, have, we'll get a phone call and, and somebody will say, hey, can we stop by? And I'll say, yeah, come on up, you know. And it's, you know, uh, you know, Don Felder from the Eagles, you know, the guitar player, or we'll have Bill Moomy, who is Will Boy, Will, in Lost in Space, and uh, and then we'll get uh, Bruce Greenwood, who is, he's on the new movie called, what, The River, I think right now, TV show, mm -hmm. but he was uh, Captain Pike in uh, Star Trek The Movie, he was a, a president. and uh, he was the president and National Treasure 2, uh, Nicolas Cage, so we, we have a lot of fun times up here, you know, and... Uh, uh, we have Danny Amos come up all the time from uh, Lost Straight Jackets and just so many, so many fun bands and stuff will we'll come by and visit. We had John Fogarty. Uh, one of our good friends is uh, Steve Miller, who uh, visits here all the time and uh, we'll go out to Billy, lunch and everything. Billy Gibbons. And Billy Gibbons is one of our, our big mm -hmm. buddies for a long, long time. He'll come up and we'll go out. And then, uh, uh, so we're, we're involved with so many neat things you know we do a thing locally called notes for notes we help a lot of young school kids get instruments for their uh classes and learn how to play guitar or, or some kind of instrument uh, drums or whatever you know it's re really pretty neat we're involved in so many parts of the music industry and uh I, i've been very honored i've been all over the world uh touring and playing and meeting so many great players like you guys out there and i really uh appreciate all the notes and letters and photos of your guitar and 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 so many of you artists out there your guitar is your little is your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever you know and it's it's such a part of your life and it's so cool that you share it with us here and I mean MJ if you look at her walls up here she's got photos from everybody from Jerry Donahue from the Hellcasters and you know we got the Slash stuff and Ingve Malstein who's just a phenomenal friend of ours and and uh, it's, it's been really great working with some of these artists, you know. And I had a chance to play with Ingve uh, when I was in Italy. And uh, for me, that was a great honor, you know. And uh, uh, we had Doug Aldridge and, and uh, George Lynch, who's a big friend of her family here and everything. And, and uh, I'm real proud of that, you know. And, it's, uh, and seeing you guys and watching you guys grow from teenagers to what you're playing now and everything, it's really... I've been doing it for a long time, and a good friend is uh, Nuki Edwards from The Ventures, who's a phenomenal guitar player, you know, and, and a guitar player, Tom Hemby and Brent Mason from Nashville, who are just like, will kill you. I mean, they're just fantastic players, and they love their instrument, you know. And I, I've worked with Tom Bresch and Buster B. Jones, who's a great finger picker. I mean, all these guys I've worked with, and, and I've been honored to do the Muriel Anderson All-Star Guitar Nights and work in from Lee Rittenauer to everybody, you know, I've had Stu Ham and Jeff Pivar uh, working with me and stuff, and uh, I've been very lucky, you know, so, and I want to be part of your life and, and someday have a chance to meet you, and if you're in Santa Barbara, we give great tours here at the factory too, so, yeah. it's really pretty neat, but we're going to be doing this, I hope, uh, weekly, and I hope you have a chance to get your questions together and have a chance to... Uh, We'll put a lot of photos on and everything, so you'll be able to see what we're doing and stuff, and from the Nam show, and so we got a lot of stuff really happening. MJ, you want to say something? Oh, next question. Yeah, next question. All right, question. we'll do one more question here. Um, this one is from WGTP from the forum, and he says, "What is the, your take on the different magnet types? It is it just different magnet strengths, or is it a different combination of materials?" Well, all the magnets do have a different. Uh, uh, Oh, what do you call it? Like a recipe, I guess you could call it. You know, uh, some people think Alnico 3 is, is weaker or stronger, and, and you know, Alnico 2s, they all have a different amount of cobalt. And what you can do is go to, 
uh, go on the internet and look under uh, magnet, um, oh, probably magnet specifications. And there's some good sites out there. And uh, I've listed a bunch years ago. I don't know if they're still around or not. But it has all the different uh, amount of, you know, Alnico, which is aluminum, nickel, and cobalt. And there's ferrous material in there. And you look at, there's different combinations. Some may have 18%. Um, some may have 12%. So, and a different amount of cobalt will give a, a magnet a different strength, you know. And they use fillers in it with aluminum, which is non-ferrous. And nickel is a ferrous material. And uh, so they all have, have a different uh, property to them. And they all can make the pickup sound or give a different magnetic field to the string. And usually the stronger the magnet, the more output you'll get out of a pickup and the brighter the pickup will be. Great. And one more quick question um, from Aceman, who's a regular on our forum. Yeah, Aceman. He's asking, um, who would you love to make a pickup for that you haven't already? Who would I love to make a pickup for that I haven't already? Um, oh boy, I mean, there's so many great players. Um, I always liked uh, Amos Garrett, who to me was just a fantastic player. He worked with uh, Maria Maldair, did Midnight New Oasis. And I don't think I've, I don't know if I've ever done any pickups for him at any time. I've never met him. So, and, uh, but I'm not really sure. I, I'm surprised that. The people that I have met, that I met for the first time, saying that I wanted to make a pickup for them, and they say, "Oh, I'm using your pickups already," or something, you know. And um, but you know, I respect uh, competitors and what what they make for their artists. They have certain artists, but you know, I, I like. I mean, I think uh, uh, Steve Vai is a great guitar player, and Joe Satriani. I've met them both. Joe has used my pickups before. And uh, I don't know if Steve I ever has, but uh, I was at his uh, uh, the Les Paul Ward show, and th that was very nice. I mean, we w were back in the back room talking and everything, and and uh, Orthini, you know, who I think is a young, just a great young guitarist. I was working with Michael Jackson. Uh, I've I've worked with Jennifer Batten, who's a fantastic guitar player, and she's been using our products for a long time. And uh, I'm not sure, God, who. Um, B.B. King. Yeah, B.B. King. I mean, he's... B.B. King, I believe. But he's, so, he's, him, he's so traditional, you know, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't step... I wouldn't want to push myself onto another uh, competitor's product. I mean, I've never really... I never wanted to do that, you know. If somebody comes to us, that's one thing, but... Uh, yeah, it's hard to say, you know. Uh, I've worked with Arlen Roth. I've made some pickups for Arlen, Arlen Roth over the years. We played and toured... Uh, Japan and everything together and he's he's just a great player too and I was very close with him and his family and uh, um, I worked with Steve McGinnis who's a guitar player on the David Letterman show and and uh, so there, there's there's a lot of just great great players I mean I, I don't know if, if anybody out there is listening to this even I mean I, I'll make something for a competitor that they can use because all these guys have many different guitars and they may want to get a certain sound which they can't get out of their current pickups and, and we can do a lot of custom things for them so I, I'd be more than happy I would love to do something like that for an artist. Great. Okay one more quick question from Eric H from the forum. Um, he was wondering are there more options available through the custom shop than what is posted on the website such as covers? Example a modern looking dog ear cover versus the vintage style dog ear cover on the Antiquity P90. Yeah, this is something like what he's talking about, this kind of cover here. These, uh, we thermoform them and um, we've done some, we, we just did stuff for um, uh, Monty Pittman with the Madonna's uh, that he played the Super Bowl and we made a bunch of gold sparkle pickups for him and everything. Silver. With, or silver sparkle pickups which were uh, kind of a different thing but we can usually uh, do or fabricate and we're getting some newer equipment where we can do a lot of different shapes and everything of guitar pickups but we'd be yeah, great I to mean, do that. To, ask, to answer more his questions if he's just specifically talking about P90 dog ears we unfortunately right now only have the old vintage ones we're seeking to get some of the other ones and it's in our works to do so 
I mean, yeah. but when we're talking about different covers, yes, we do have different covers. I mean, other different covers. I mean, even on pinatas without holes, without holes in the middle, on different covers, because that also help us create different types of pickups underneath. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, covers. We had covers with. I mean, no, no top, just surrounds. We had covers with the slats. We had covers on, on different materials. We have shallower covers. Yes, I mean, the custom shop expands a lot, and we have yeah. a lot of new bobbins, a lot of covers, a lot of colors, you know, I mean, that we can do, I mean, we can do trombackers in almost any color. And, um, we, and we can modify the pole spacing or put different uh, shapes into them. But anyway, we're about done here. Uh, I want to thank everybody and, and uh, let us know how you guys are doing and if we can help you and contact SeymourDuncan.com and I really appreciate it and thank you guys very much for coming along. And just remember, shop. just remember, if okay. you dream it, we can do it. Thank you. <laughs>